appreciate your giving tonight. Just bring it up, put it in the offering pan, if you will. Those of you that are here, we are we are thankful for your faithfulness to the house of the Lord. Surely there's a lot of different places you could be tonight. And like myself, you're probably tired. You could have used it, could have went to bed early, and it probably wouldn't have bothered you a bit tonight. Like myself, I probably could have went to bed early, wouldn't have bothered me a bit. Got a little extra sleep, but I made the sacrifice to be here. And it's not just because I'm the pastor. Uh, I, I could have quit any time I wanted to. And after all these years, I've just pressed on right along. We're going to be turning the Bible tonight to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 tonight in your Bibles. And this is where we're going to read from. This is where we're going to try to share the message from Matthew chapter 10 tonight. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to stand, but uh, I'm going to read through a few verses, and uh, we're just going to use the Bible as our text tonight, and uh, outline, if you will. Everyone have it? Chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10. We're going to start with verse 1. Everyone got it? All right. The Bible says this, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, and James the son of Alphaeus, Elevaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatever city or whatsoever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go, it, go thence. And when you have come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as servants, serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. 
For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents, cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel to the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord, if they be called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of this his household? Now I want you to skip down to verse number 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Read that again. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. This is what the Lord laid on my heart, and I want to talk to us about tonight. A mission, a mission with opposition. That's what we're going to preach about, talk about teach about, if you will, tonight, a mission with opposition. Raise your hand to the Lord tonight. Let's pray for the will of God. Father, we love you tonight. We appreciate your word. I'm asking you that somehow that this message will penetrate a heart, help someone to understand your word more fully and to serve you completely, and we'll give you the praise for what you do. Add the anointing which makes preaching and teaching edifying, and we'll praise you in the name of Jesus, and everyone can say amen. Preaching tonight, talking to you tonight on a mission with opposition. How many of you understand what a mission is? If I give you a mission, that means I give you a set of plans or a certain set of guidelines or some set thing that you are to accomplish. If I give you the mission of going to the grocery store and picking up certain groceries for me, you're on a mission. As you walk down the aisles of Walmart with your buggy in hand and you're getting the things that Brother Myers asked you to get, you are on a type of mission. We are simple enough, simple-minded enough to understand that every mission has certain requirements, certain fulfilled things that we're to accomplish within that mission. If you look at it at a greater scale than just going to the grocery store, think of how tonight that the military has different branches, such as the Navy SEALs. Whenever Osama bin Laden was to be taken down, there was a group of Navy SEALs that had a mission. That mission was to go into the enemy's territory, find a way to get past their guards and everything else, and take Osama bin Laden out. And they, as a matter of fact, they completed that mission and they did do what they had set out to do. My question tonight is, is what exactly is the mission that God has given the church? The mission that God gives you and the mission that he's given me. The next question that I'd like to ask is, are we fulfilling the mission that God has given us. Some have called this mission the Great Commission. To what? Go into the highways and the hedges and to compel them to come in that the Lord's house might be full. That is the commission that God has given us. Now, if you look back at our chapter here, the book of Matthew chapter 10, it starts off by saying, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. This was a calling that he put on the 12 disciples. He called them to do a work for him. Does anyone agree with that? Similar to the calling that these 12 disciples have on their life, you and I as a Christian 
have a calling on our life as well tonight. We must understand that God has called you and he's called me to do something in the kingdom of God. Say amen tonight. God has called you and me to get out there in the highways and hedges and live the life and to share the testimony of what Christ has done in our life that others may be saved and come to the light and the knowledge of the truth. And so the same way that these disciples were called, you and I are also called. But he calls them, and we see this in verse number 1, verse number 2, and verse number 3 talks about those that he has called of the 12 disciples going into verse number 4. Verse number 5, he said, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go, not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Well, you know the calling that God has called us to is a calling to all men. You see, the twelve disciples at this particular period in time were called to go out and preach not to the Gentiles or the Samaritan half-breed people, but he was, they were called to go out and preach to the Jews. But you see, the mission that they had was similar to the mission that we have today. That is to get out there and get the message out to all the people. Now, some people would think, well, that's just for the preachers to do. That's just the preacher's job. But you understand tonight the Great Commission was not just for a few elect. It was not just for a few called preachers, but the Great Commission is for all the church to get the message out. You see, if he's going to fill everyone with the Holy Ghost, if he's willing to baptize everybody, it's for all people, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost is to help us to be effective to reach the lost, then I would think that he's going to baptize us and equip us. He has called all of us to do this great commission. Wouldn't you agree with that tonight? So we understand. So he sends them out. He says in verse 6, Go not rather to the lost sheep. It says, Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils freely, have received, so freely give. What he is trying to convey to them is on this mission, what I want you to do is I want you to take what I have done in you and I want you to convey that to the lost. In other words, you and I, we also have that same mission. If, we're, if God has healed you, now he wants you to turn and he wants you to rend that you have done, you receive to do to others. You are able with the power of God in your life to be able to convey the same things that have been done in you in other people's life. Do you know that one of the greatest things that people face today is discouragement? One of the greatest things that people today face is depression. Some of us, when God found us, we were in a state of discouragement, depression, and sinfulness. But God gave us the power to overcome these things. And through you and your testimony, God can use you to help others to overcome the depression and discouragement and greater than anything, the sin that is in their life through the sacrifice that Christ paid on the cross. But I do believe tonight that the same way that he gave them power, he also gave us power. He said that in Luke 10 and 19, he said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. And so I believe that you and I are supposed to have and obtain that same power that these disciples had. I believe a lot of times we set ourselves short that we're not capable of doing what they did. But if you, in fact, believe the Bible and you believe Christ, I believe that we we should have the same power to do what they did. Can you say amen to that tonight? So I believe he goes on here to say how that they're going to raise the dead, cast out devils and all of this. In verse number 9, he said, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purse nor scrip for your journey and all of these things. What was he saying, Brother Myers? Well, I believe that what he was trying to get them to do is lean not to the material things but to make a step and a leap of faith. You see, if you're going to leave the house without a lot of possessions, he wanted them to pack light on material things to pack heavy on faith. Does that make sense to you? So when you walk out the front door of your house, I want you to pack light. Don't take a coat. Don't take two coats. Don't take two purses. Don't take a lot of extra money. All of this, he said, pack light on material things, but I want you to pack heavy on faith. In other words, you're going to have to depend on faith that I'm going to keep you and I'm going to take care of you. 
Do you know whenever my wife and I evangelized, there were a lot of places we went to by faith. I remember one time we left one place and we didn't have any money. We had just a certain amount of gas and we didn't know how we were going to get there. And the gas that we had in the vehicle was not enough to carry us where we were going. To make a long story short, the van was on E for many, 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 many miles. And I remember thinking that we're going to cut out at any point. About an hour and a half later, we were driving on empty for over an hour and a half, two hours. I still to this day don't know how the Lord did it, but he did it somehow. And I will never forget that as we pulled into the parking lot, we pulled into the space where we were to get to to preach that morning. And guess what? The van ran out of gas as we were pulling up into the parking place. Remember that, Sister Myers? The Lord provided. And guess what? We got there that day. They took up a $500 offering that morning to give to us, and they put us up in a night nice hotel. But you say, we we left that day. When we left one church to go to that meeting, we left without much material possession at all. As a matter of fact, didn't have really anything except for the clothes we had on our back and what not to take with us. But we packed heavy on faith. We drove that van. I could have left the parking lot that day and said, oh, we better turn around. We don't have enough to make it. But we packed heavy on faith and we left light on the material things. And you see, that's what God was calling the disciples disciples to do, to go into a way and go into a place, into harm's way to carry the message of the gospel. Do you know tonight that that is the mission that God has given the church today? And unfortunately, we don't realize that we want to be petted. We want to be patted. We want everything to be perfect. We want to have plenty of money. We want to have everything at our fingertips. We don't want to struggle. We don't want to have offense. We don't want anybody to be mad at us, but we want to still somehow preach the gospel. Can I tell you, it's not always going to be a red carpet laid before us. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be without struggle, but can I tell you through the struggle that a lot of people's lives can be touched because of your struggle. Can you say amen tonight? But the Bible shows us here that they were to go into a city in verse number 11 to inquire in that city who was worth, who in it was worthy, and there they were to abide to go in thence. In other words, Sister uh, uh, Benefield, they were to go into that city and find people that would lodge them and take care of them. Can you imagine going into a place in Orlando trying to find somebody that would take you into their house and take care of you? I don't know that that would happen in our day, but I can tell you this. They were, they were to depend on somebody else's willingness to freely take them in and to care for them. And the Bible said if they did not take you and they did not have, and you, their peace was not upon you, in other words, if they would not receive you, your peace would return unto you. And when you were to leave that house, that you were to shake off the dust of your feet. As you begin to read here in verse number four, uh, 14, verse number 15, he said, Verily I say unto it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. I want you to see something tonight. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to talk much longer, but I want you to hear something because we've already talked so much tonight. But I want you to see something here. He says that it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than it would be for that city that rejects the gospel. For those people that are out there saying that God is too loving to uh, cast judgment upon people and that every, they act as though everybody that says they're Christian, everybody, whatever, is going to die and, and be saved, I want you to know something. This scripture proves right here people that reject the gospel are going to have greater judgment cast upon them than Sodom and Gomorrah did. Say amen, somebody. Do you know that that's a sad thing? But the Lord tells these disciples this is the fact there's going to be great judgment and that in itself should have compelled them enough to do what the Lord had called them to do. Would you agree with that tonight? Behold, he says in verse number 16, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I told you I want to talk to you tonight and I'm not going to talk long because I don't feel the best. I just told you I was just in the hospital the other day, so I'm still not feeling the best tonight. But I will share this with you tonight. This was the, this was the title that the Lord had given me, a mission with opposition. Do you know that we are going to face junk whenever we serve the Lord? And you're really going to face junk whenever you try to portray Christ and you try to, you try to preach the message and you try to convey the message to the lost. And you know because of that that a lot of people are not doing it. People don't want to be offensive, so they don't, want, they don't say anything. 
you, you would have to agree with me that there have been times yourself that you didn't want somebody to be mad at you, so even though you wanted to tell them the truth, you didn't say nothing. You might as well admit it. We've all done it at some point or another. You were at that family reunion, and you wanted to tell somebody they were going to die lost if they didn't get their life straightened out, but you didn't want to be the bad guy, so you didn't say a thing. Come on, am I right? We've all just about it been there. When you wanted to tell somebody you loved them, you didn't want to see them die lost, but you know how they take everything, so you didn't say nothing. Am I right? Or they don't let, they never listen to you, or they won't uh, accept your call if you tell them to say too much about the Lord, so you decided not to say nothing. You see, the Lord warns these disciples and says, people are not going to receive what you have to say. There are going to be people that are not going to like it. He says in verse number 16 here, or verse number 17, going into this, he says, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Then he says, but beware of men, for they will deliver you up for the, to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. There's two things I want you to see here. The Lord says, I am sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. He already forewarned them it ain't going to be easy. Do you know that a lot of preachers drop out of the ministry completely and a lot of people fall out of church when times get tough? But you see, the Lord told them in advance, this mission will have opposition. This mission is going to have problems. This mission is not going to be easy. This mission is going to have setbacks. But you have got to continue to fight regardless of what opposition comes your way. I am sending you like innocent Sheep in the midst of growling, vicious wolves. You know what wolves will do to a pack of sheep? They'll chew them up and spit them out. Do you know that's what the world wants to do to the church is chew up the church and spit it out? But yet the Lord sent us anyway. You know what that tells me? This message carries enough weight and this message is precious enough that the Lord is willing to send his precious sheep in the midst of wolves so that he might convert some wolf into a sheep. The message is that worthy that he would send heaven's best, that he would send the only begotten son that somebody might get saved, even though some are going to reject it. This mission is going to have opposition. This mission is going to have setbacks. This mission is going to have problems. This mission is not going to be without opposition. But you must stay in this mission. I want to tell you that there's a lot of folks that have not received this mission and some that thought they did and have not done nothing but go to church and sit on a pew. This mission is so serious that people got to get busy and do something or otherwise people are going to die lost. I want to share something with you tonight as I get ready here in just a moment to close. You know, several years ago I remember that we were in a church service. And I've shared this at some point I recall. But we were in a church service where I think it was a revival, but it was a Wednesday night. So most churches were in a midweek service. And we had one of those shouting services where everybody was shouting and praising the Lord. And, boy, they were kicking their heels and hooping and hollering. And everybody was going crazy and spinning in circles and flopping like fish in the floor and everything else. One of them Holy Ghost service. You know that's what we call it, where, the, where we say the Holy Ghost took over. Yet I've never understood that because the Holy Ghost should always have control. Say amen. But you see, after the service was over with, everybody that shouted and everybody that danced and everything ran, we went to Denny's. And I'm not going to tell you what church that we were in at that time, but we were in a particular church, and we went to this Denny's after the service was over with. And when we got to that Denny's, there was this Baptist fella. I didn't know him. I only had heard about him. And this man, I remember that he, was, he would go to this Denny's, and he would go uh, booth to booth. And it, it amazed me because as I sat there and we waited on our food, I watched this guy, and the whole time we were there, he must have sat in about five to, to, to eight, maybe as many as ten different booths. And this man would go from booth to booth, and he would share his testimony with people, trying to lead people to Christ. And I thought to myself, I watched him as he talked to this one family, and he sat there giving them his testimony, and these people were crying, weeping, and I believe from what it appeared as though that they had given their life to Christ. So there was at least one booth, if not many others, that were affected by this man's testimony. And I sat there, and I had to think to myself, Sister Reba, 
You know, it's a sad day in the church and the hour that we're in that we come to church and we pack pews in some places. Anymore, we're not packing many pews. But we come to church and we sit on these pews and we shout and we dance and we run and everything else. We get a good feel good. We get a goose bump. The preacher preaches. We think he preaches a great message. But yet, we're really not doing what that man done. And I thought to myself, that man accomplished more in the time that we waited on our food than the church did all night shouting and dancing around the altar and, and waving their hands and feeling like they really did something and some of them didn't get a thing. It was just wildfire and a reason to make out like they really got something. But if we really got something, wouldn't what we got cause us to get more fired up about this mission? You see what's happening in the church is we have turned this thing into more about pacifying people and putting bibs on people and diapers and pampers on folks and digging people out of the ditch. Preachers are preaching more messages about pick me up, get me out of the ditch, get me out of my miserable state of mind. Oh, would you just get back in the fight? Come on, get back in the fight. Preachers are preaching and more messages and sermons in our day about, oh, come on, you can make it. Come on, get up off the floor, you can get by. Come on, you're going to see, oh, you're fighting the devil, but you're going to be all right. That's about the size of the message of today. But yet that man, I think of him, and I think to myself, that man probably accomplished more in 45 minutes or an hour's time than some churches do in a whole week's worth of revival. Isn't that a sad thing in a day that we're living in? Isn't that an indictment and a sad thing on the church of today? But I wonder what the sheep are doing. Are the sheep just coming to church to hear a gospel sermon? Are the sheep just coming to church to have a feel good? Are the sheep just coming to church to hear a, a few songs and a feel good? Oh, I love that song. Oh, that song makes me feel so good. But if that song doesn't compel you to do more than just live good, if that sermon, uh, that doesn't do you enough to make you want to go out there and tell somebody else about Christ and win the loss, I'm telling you, this mission's got enough opposition and it's not causing you to do nothing more than just coast along. Say, God, help us tonight. Anybody feel what I'm saying tonight? I tell you tonight, I'm only by, I'm riding by fear and faith only tonight. That's the only way I'm able to preach to you tonight, by the grace of God. But I want you to understand what the Lord's trying to show you, and he's trying to show me and show so many people out, out there. There is grievous wolves. There is a devil out there. There is a fight. Yes, it's going to be bad. But I'm going to jump over to verse number 28. I've read you enough Bible tonight. You pretty much got what I'm trying to say. He said, and fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. The next time that you're standing in the Walmart checkout line or you're standing at Publix and you got that opportunity or you're standing in the street corner somewhere or you're at that family reunion or at that birthday party or that get-together and you feel the Spirit of God compelling you to reach out and witness to somebody or tell them about the love of God and there you sit in fear and, the, and you're wondering, well, well, what in the world? I want to tell you something. God never promised you it was going to be easy. He never promised you that they wouldn't get mad at you. There, you know what he said here in the Scripture? He said that they were going to hate them. Did you hear me? He said they're going to hate him. He said if, you, if they hate you, they hated me already. Come on, if they hate me, what makes you think that you're any better? They hated me. They, they hated the Lord so much that many of them crucified him. Do you know that there are people out there that hate you for telling them the truth? That the homosexual is going to hate you for telling them that that lifestyle is going to send them to hell. Come on, the abortionist is going to hate you for telling them what they did is going to send them to hell if they don't repent of it. They're going to hate you if you tell them that adultery is wrong. If they're living in adultery, they're going to hate you if you tell them fornication is wrong. But I want you to know if you spare them the, the penalty of the judgment of death, death and hell, do you know that if you spare them that it was worth what you had to go through to tell them the truth? I'm not the most popular preacher. Just look around you. You'll see tonight. We discussed that a little bit before service. But I want to tell you something. Of all the years that I've preached this gospel, I never tried to be popular. I never wanted to be popular. I just wanted somebody to know there's a God in heaven that loves us and a God that wants us to be on the right path. Holiness is still right. Sanctified living is still right. If people don't get back to living for God with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength and body, which is the first commandment, they have totally missed the mark. This is not about being religious. People play bingo religiously. Alcoholics drink alcohol religiously but it's about having a real relationship and a relationship that compels us to help somebody else to have that kind of relationship how many knows this mission's got a lot of opposition how many's been serving the Lord for a while have you seen the opposition how many have seen churches fought so hard until the church finally quit 
How many have seen some stuff happen that made people fall out of the race? Am I right? How many have had people say things to you like, well, that church hurt me, and I'll never go back to a church because of opposition. The mission had opposition. Many are called, but few are chosen. I'm telling you, as I was praying tonight, I'm thinking about how the Bible said that hell has enlarged itself and many are going in there at because of deception, because of evil, because of unrighteousness has exploded. It was never the Lord's will for it to be that way. And the only way that it's going to change is if we, the sheep, start telling other people there is hope, there is a better way. Stand to your feet tonight. I want you to understand that Pastor...